sexually segregated. I'm not sure if I dig that too much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I, I just wanted to start by giving our uh, members of our millennial generation Y just a warm round of applause, a welcome. So just a quick uh, survey so I know who has the background information. How many folks were in our, our just our previous conversation, our previous talk? Great, thank you for making it over here. I really appreciate it. My name is Josh Tekel. I am a filmmaker. I specialize in millennials or Generation Y, consulting, writing books, making movies, and more importantly, in interacting with these amazing young people. Today, we have uh, some incredible, incredible representatives of this generation. They may be in some ways, um, in some ways they may be analogous to the 80 million people in the US that are roughly 80 million between the ages of 15 and 35. In some ways, they are anomalous, okay? And I'll let them tell you a little bit more about how that is. Uh, we're missing one member of our panel. He may or may not come, okay? <laughs> we'll see. All right, so. That's what you get for dealing with millennials. <laughs> right. <laughs> They may not be on time, but let me tell you, they work hard, okay? Those emails and text messages at 3 a.m. Are, are something to behold. Um, so maybe just a, just a quick two or three lines about yourselves. You know, I'm, my name is, I'm from, why I'm here is, and if you don't know why you're here, make up a reason. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get started with our questions. Yeah. Does that sound good? Do you want to yeah. begin, Lee? Or actually, let's begin with the ladies, and we'll work our way back to the... Why don't you begin, Daniela? Okay, my name is Daniela Ordonez. Um, I'm from Colombia. I am a student at ASU, and I'm here um, at, to learn about all of innovation and education, as well as to show you what millennials are and what we what we're all about. So, uh, my name is Lisa Katib. I went to the University of Illinois, and I studied uh, sociology with a concentration in psychology. I am now a team leader at City of Chicago, and I came to this conference to do a kind of a presentation speech earlier and then to sit on this panel. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Jasmine Johnson from South Carolina. Um, I attend the University of South Carolina where I'm currently a junior majoring in education. And I'm here because last summer I participated on a road trip with Road Trip Nation that kind of put me in a place to be here today, so. Hi, uh, my name is Lee Jang. Um, I went to Northwestern University. I graduated about five years ago and uh, I'm just a very simple capitalist. I'm here because uh, I work at GSV and we're the hosts, so I guess some, someone threw me on this panel. I think they thought you were an exceptional representative. But um, So, uh, full disclosure, I did not select these young people. They were selected by GSV and um, emailed, I just got their email addresses on one. So, and, and, and also full disclosure, we have had uh, one Skype call with almost everybody and then a, a second Skype call with those who couldn't make it. So we've, we've gone over the questions. They actually generated some of the questions that we'll be looking at today. And if they're speedy and fast, we will have time to open it up for your questions, okay? And if not, that's okay because the content is wonderful, all right? So our first question, and everyone gets a crack at this, but we talked about being reasonably brief because we're on a tight schedule. Is your generation entitled? Are you entitled? Who wants to take the first crack? Dun, 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 dun. I guess I'll take it. Um, in my opinion, there are people who are entitled, just like in every generation, there are people who are entitled. But as a whole, I think that we are a generation of change, and we all want something different. And we are so busy trying to figure out how to get to that change that it sometimes comes off as self-entitled because we're always asking why us or how can we do something instead of asking as a, I guess asking opinions of older people and asking for the advice of older people who have kind of lived through things before and so it comes off as self-entitled when it's really just kind of, we're just trying to change and we're so busy trying to be new and independent that we don't ask for the help. Thank you. Um, additionally, I think that there's like the world has changed so much and there's just higher standards for us to meet 
that uh, we've had to work even harder maybe sometimes just to meet up with expectations of education, getting a master, knowing about technology, and being flexible. So I believe that we're not self-entitled. We are actually having to work even faster than other generations and adapt in a different way. I think this generation values making a difference and seeing impact in the world and like social change. So I work for an organization where there's 3,000 uh, currently AmeriCorps members, and that's just this year alone. And they all, the last thing they think about is themselves. They're constantly waking up every morning. Um, they work with their own set of students. They throw service events. All they do every day is work for the good of the bigger cause and to help their students succeed and give them the resources that they need. Yeah, uh, I, I never actually think about this, this word entitlement. I mean, maybe the problem is it's just so ingrained that we don't even think about it. But, but I think I read a study, and I can send you guys the link afterwards, where th they talked about um, millennials. When they did a survey, they said that only 1% of millennials thought that being famous was important, was very important to them. And th there's a difference between being self-centered and being self-expressive. And millennials are self-expressive because they have the tools and the means to do it now instantaneously, in, instantaneously anywhere, anytime. It's great. It, you know, these are wonderful answers. Thank you. One of the interesting things that uh, we've seen in our surveys is there has been this intense shift, especially as the Generation Y hit the media space toward fame, you know, toward this self-aggrandizing, I'm going to be a YouTube star, I'm going to be a, a, you know, on God knows what TV show as a star, right? Uh, and that has softened and maybe is in the middle of shifting at this point. And we're seeing the Where Are They Now TV shows. I don't know if you guys have seen the Where Are They Now TV shows, but if you look at like, you know, people that are famous, I won't name any names, from, say, Gen X or Boomers, and you're like, where are they now? And then you see how they are. You're like, oh, dude, I do not want to end up, you know, in rehab, uh, you know, in debt, with a broken family. And so, you know, this popularization is fame as a way of sort of, you know, filling that void has gone down. And it may be, it may actually be shifting in the generation. Um, if you read a lot of media articles about millennials and Gen Y, which I do, um, you get this, w this other word. Entitled is the first word you get. It's always the first word. The second word that'll come up is lazy. Okay, lazy. Especially with punctuality. You, you can't dress like the rest of us. You know, look, you, you just get with the program, right? Is your generation lazy? Well, I will start with that one. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of what this organization is, um, CityEar is a education nonprofit based. And my core members, I'm currently a team leader, so I lead a group of 10 young adults, and they each have eight focusless students in academics, six focusless students in behavior, where they teach them social emotional skills, and then they have an extra eight, six to eight attendance focusless students. So throughout the school day, they're constantly like tracking and working with these students. Um, on top of that, they run their own after school program. They also throw school-wide events for 200 plus people. They throw service events throughout the city and all this for a very small living stipend. Um, of course, we do get many benefits as well, which allows us to do this work. But I would not say we are lazy because it's very hard work that we do every single day. Yeah, well, me coming from Colombia, I think uh, one of the things that I've seen a lot is uh, people not being lazy, our generation not being lazy, just trying to overachieve their goals, like being able to, to go out there and achieve whatever it needs to be. And in Colombia, like um, youth doesn't have the same opportunity as anyone else in the world. And I've seen firsthand experience how they really, really work hard to reach it. And they go over and beyond to keep learning and to adapt to such a fast grow, growing world, basically. So no, I don't think they're lazy. I think I would say um, I don't think we're lazy because look at all that we've done. Um, all the technological investments didn't come from just one generation. That had to come from us as well, and we work together with older generations to get these things done. So if we were lazy, none of it would be done. And also, too, you have to pose a rhetorical question of, 
you know, if we, if you say that we never show up on time, who taught us that that was okay? Like, so you have to kind of think of those <laughs> questions before you call us lazy and say, oh, they don't know how to be punctual or they don't know how to dress properly. But when I go to work and my boss has on jeans and then she says, I don't dress properly, it's kind of a double standard as to what we can do versus what you guys can do. Hear that? <laughs> So, uh, Josh, I think, the, I think my answer to your question um, is yes and no. Uh, millennials and people, you know, people that I know, actually will not work hard in things that they do not believe in. They will not work hard just for the sake of grinding themselves to death. And so uh, I was um, talking to this uh, guy uh, at an accounting firm, and they have this huge problem of retaining young millennial workers and I think uh, in certain industries and certain jobs there's going, going to be a existential crisis in these companies where they have a problem of retaining millennials, developing millennial talent um, and if you look at the top and in, in, in your talk the top employers are Facebook, Google, the US federal government because these are the places where millennials feel that they can make a positive impact on the world and in fact, if you get them to these places, they'll work a lot harder. There are a lot of people who do unpaid internships. If you give them the right opportunity, that's fun and engaging. And uh, you can actually get a lot out of um, these companies. There are companies at the summit uh, that effectively use um, college students as their workforce. So Course Hero is an example. And uh, the millennials at these universities work incredibly hard for their companies because they believe in what they're doing. So the answer is yes and no. Great. So I just thank you for those answers. And I don't mean to use you as lab rats, but I'm going to use you as lab rats for a second. I just want you guys to pay you, the audience, a little bit of attention to some of the specific words that were used in the answer. Fun, engaging, work hard if it has meaning, and looking for social services to do things good for society. Uh, also, looking to make ends meet and looking to get ahead, okay? So the sort of the aptitude is there for hard work. The ability is definitely there, but the willingness is dependent on meeting criteria which are not criteria that were applicable for Gen X. They're not criteria that were applicable for baby boomer workplaces. Baby boomer workplaces did not have to be fun. That was not a requirement. Okay, um, I told you that I have exceptionally good retention and loyalty from <clears throat> the Generation Y people that work with me. Part of that is because what they just expressed is exactly what we've baked into our business. I have a, a filmmaking business, film production business. So once a week, we take a field trip and we've gone go-kart racing, we've gone bowling, we've got, I mean, they, and they make up what they want to do. So the next trips are, they want to do uh, bungee jumping, there's ice skating, somebody wants to do skydiving. That's what we do. And it's fun. And I just have to adapt because that's what makes the workplace, and no, not every workplace, you can't take 50,000 employees skydiving, right? <laughs> but I work closely with a lot of different companies that have weekend programs. They have fun things happening all the time. And they're engaging and they're up to changing the world, and they're meeting these criteria. So I don't care what kind of business you're in, this is possible. Um, and they get to work with you. <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> good <Well>. and bad. <laughs> you know, the, the, there is actually a point of, uh, of um, working with inspired leaders and, and uh, working with millennials have probably a higher uh, propensity to work with people that they love, mm -hmm. rather than just working at a job because of, you know, what we just talked about. Right. Well, I mean, one of the things that um, you've brought up to me uh, individually, okay, in conversations we've had, is the importance of family. And the intersection of family and work, which for Gen X was like, what you do at work is at work. That's, and then you go home. <laughs> and that's where your family is. But when your work becomes part of your family, uh, the lines tend to blur for those of us who grew up with those as segregated, it's uncomfortable for members of your generation. 
you kind of work with, you, you told me, uh, 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 Jasmine, about traveling with these people in this bus. They became your family, right? And, and you've, both, you've all mentioned family when you talk about work. So how do you create that relationship at work where your work environment is much more family, not family oriented, it's actually family, all right? Um, next question, is Aachen here? He's not. Okay, just wanted to make sure we gave him every opportunity because he was the one that came up with this question. The question is, when is the right time for your generation to get politically involved or to get involved in politics? And I'll broaden it for you because you often, when you hear politics, you often think of my generation's version of politics or your parents' version of politics, but your version of politics so far has involved uh, Occupy Wall Street, it's involved Arab Spring, it's involved um, uh, the reaction against SOPA and PIPA, the regulation of the internet, and it's involved um, things like what's happening in the state of Indiana at the current moment. If you've been paying attention, you've seen that, okay? So when is the right time for your generation to get involved in politics? Well, this is a very interesting question because, as you said, sometimes when you think about politics, you just think about who's running for president or senator or things like that. And for me, as a member of this generation, I think more of politics towards uh, social, social responsibility, so towards um, civil actions of, of goodness, of standing up for what you believe is right and other people's rights and equality. So I believe that the right time to be able to engage in these activities is once you've been able to form your own perception of what is good. Because sometimes our, our generation tends to just look at, oh, this celebrity thinks this, so we should go ahead with it. So I believe that politics is very, res like it needs to be very responsible. So it needs to be taught to our generation in a positive way where they are allowed to, to think critically. Yeah, to me, politics is really just education and it's finding out every single detail you need to find out about that specific issue and then making sure you're getting that knowledge from different sources before you even come up with your own opinion. Um, but as a tutor, I made sure to teach my students to always advocate for themselves. If they got a wrong answer on something, it wasn't just, okay, I got that wrong. You need to ask your teacher exactly what you did wrong on that and how to make that better. Um, if you felt that someone was being unjust towards you, you need to find your voice and stick up for yourself. And so this really is just about education and the best time to learn is always now. So, now. <laughs> Yeah, I think going off of what Lizette said, it's about advocating for yourself and it's about advocating for people around you and your environment, your hometown, your community. And I work with middle schools on a daily basis and they do not hesitate to tell you what they think is wrong about you, themselves, other people. And I think them being able to form that opinion at 10, 11, 12, and 13 says a lot about the things that they can accomplish if we just take that time to actually teach them what they need to know about politics and what they should know about the community and community action plans and how to create things and how to build things. If we actually give them the opportunity and put the responsibility on them to advocate for themselves and their community, I think that they can make more change than I could. So, so do you guys know who presides over the largest and fastest growing nation on the planet? I'll give you a hint, it's a millennial. Mark Zuckerberg. Facebook has 1.4 billion people and is growing faster than any other country in the world. So, uh, my point is that when it comes to why, why do we do, why do we go through the political process is because we think we can make some change that, that's fundamental in our country, in our, in our um, neighborhoods, in our communities. And I think, uh, you know, there's a huge, I'm a Silicon Valley person through and through, so there's a huge bias from where I come from where you know, the, the, the basis for action, the basis for driving change is I'll start a company and I will, you know, create, I will build the solution that I want. Forget this whole government thing that uh, I can't figure out, but I will, you know, build the product that I want to solve this problem. Uh, but I do think that, that, uh, that political engagement is important. I think that the, the, here's, here's where I think we can make a fundamental, you know, improvement on the millennials' engagement in politics is if the government can become more transparent, more, there has to be a sort of two-way communication, 
as you talked about in your talk, um, where we can interact with uh, someone in the government rather than being some sort of, you know, massive institution somewhere on the East Coast. Did you guys hear the distrust of big institutions? <laughs> okay. You know, average college graduate in the U.S. graduates with $30,000 in debt, mostly to the U.S. government. In California, my great state, they graduate with forty to $100,000 in debt. So, you know, the propensity to think that politics is generated by and is dictated by and should be the domain of the U.S. government is going plummeting. It's going down like a, like a, like a stone in a well. Um, this is a great question that you guys generated. What is your generation doing worse than prior generations? Um, I think that we as a generation are, a lot of us are failing to become empathetic and we're losing the sense of empathy for other people, which is not a good thing. Um, and I feel like we don't have to, with technology, we can communicate face to face, but it's really screen to screen. And you know, it's so much cyber bullying going on, things like that, where you can type to someone on a keyboard and not think twice about it because you don't see the effect that it has on somebody else. And so I think as a generation, we're failing to keep empathy and we're failing to understand that just because I have feelings doesn't mean that you don't. And I think that we should actually think human to human, we all have feelings and things like that. Um, another thing that you could see in our generation, maybe it's the fact that sometimes we take seniority for granted. We probably sometimes think that this is what they taught us in business school. This is what the theory says. So I'm not going to listen to those who have been doing this job for a long time because this is how things are done now. And I believe that there's a really, really huge value in experience. So it's very important that every millennial understands that maybe, yes, the theories are important, but experience is something that is needed as well. I'm going to piggyback off of empathy. Um, I do feel like we are spending too much time behind computers and not enough time like in the streets and acting on the issues. And so this was my initial uh, response to this. But after thinking, it was like, contrary to popular belief, there is a lot of people and many organizations out there that are, on, are involved in service work, and I'm a clear example of that. So I think we need to get away from the computers and actually go do something about these issues the way that other organizations are doing it. I mean, if you, if you look at the data, I guess the data sort of suggests that millennials are horrible at buying houses, uh, getting married, and having babies. But um, you know, I think one thing that our generation, and this was my original answer uh, to you, Josh, we, we get distracted easily because we can. Because the, the, the tools and the online digital properties allow us to, be, uh, to look at the best of everybody else's lives. And so we tend to sort of just look at that and, and not focus on what we're doing. And I think that one of the challenges for our generation is managing this infobesity of just notifications, tweets, buzzes, snaps, and everything that's coming at us. And, it, and it, actually, I think it is sort of a daily challenge and problem is, is sort of being able to define what you want to do, stay focused on what you're doing, rather than looking at everybody else's uh, idealized digital image of their lives. Very powerful. Yeah. Do you want to add something? Real quick. And yeah. I think it's important to note that we are only putting the positive things on social media, right? So I'm going to put my A plus, but not the hard struggle that I had to get to get that A plus. So keep in mind that what we do see on social media are just the positive lights and not the struggle that gets to that. Yeah, I really, you know, I can't emphasize enough how important this set of answers is. Um, you know, we started with empathy as something that has, uh, you know, from the perspective of somebody inside this generation has eroded to some degree. Empathy and narcissism are on the opposite sides of the emotional spectrum, uh, as any psychologist will tell you. So, you know, you see a shift one way and away from something else. Um, we talked about, you know, experience being important. Again, there's a tremendous amount of respect between, for the most part, again, these are vast generalizations, we have to go back to the statistics eventually, but tremendous amount of respect between 
this generation and its parents because of the coaching, mentoring relationship, but that respect doesn't necessarily migrate into the workplace if the relationship in the workplace is not the same. So it's like, oh, you're not gonna treat me the way I've been treated. Well, just because you have 25 years at this job doesn't mean I have to listen to you if you're gonna talk to me like that, you know? But if you're gonna talk to me like my mom, you know, I'll take the coaching. And then we talked about um, getting out from behind a screen. You know, this is something I emphasized in the other room. This is a generation that has had more screen time than any other and will continue to. Uh, in uh, Singapore, the average screen time for somebody in Generation Y is 30 hours a day. How is that possible? <laughs> well, simple. When you've got two or three screens, your screen time goes up, okay? And so that leads into what you said, Lee, which is this is a very distracting universe that we are handing off. And if you look at how marketing is done, if you go onto Facebook and you spend time on YouTube, you will notice the advertising is not flatlining, it is going like this. And it is targeted, and it is personalized, and it knows where you've been, and it knows where you're going, and it knows what you like, and who you like, and what they like. Okay, so it's intelligent, tailored, choice-based, you know, almost artificially intelligent advertising, which is directed specifically at this age group, spending 1.3 trillion a year, gonna be spending 5 trillion a year in 10 years. That's unbelievable. So, you know, to some degree, whether we're in an industry that sells goods or services, whether in the holy grail of, you know, being benevolent educators, or we're just making money off this generation. We also have to take responsibility for how that is affecting them. Social scientists tell us this is the most anxious, depressed generation in history. Eight times more anxious and depressed than we were in the 1970s. Why? Well, you spend a lot of time online Yes, you're socially connected. Yes, Mark Zuckerberg has built this empire, but the number one word that young people use to describe their generation in interviews that I've done is isolated. How can you be isolated if you're part of 1.3 billion people, you're socially connected? Well, being in front of a screen is not the same as being with a friend or a loved one, okay? So these are big issues, big issues that you guys face and members of your generation face. And I don't think, you know, we, as not your generation, I don't think we take these into account enough when we're like, can you just be here on time? <laughs> you know, can you just wear what we're wearing? <laughs> can you just not go up to the CEO and talk directly to them? <laughs> we don't always think in their terms, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, great, questions that you guys generated and wonderful answers. And now I want to open it up for some questions from the audience and we'll do hands. You put your hand up first. Yes, please. So, so did everybody hear the question? Yeah, great. I think first we have to become aware of what's going on and how to get into it. Um, a lot of people our age dismiss politics because that's our parents' thing, that's not our thing. So I think we have to make it more relevant and make it more aware to so many more millennials so that we know, okay, it's not just some weird place that just happens to be floating in the middle of, you know, D.C. or anything like that, but it's just, you just have to make it accessible and right now it's just not accessible and it's not transparent and you don't know what's going on until something explodes and pops out and then everybody's mad at everybody so yeah yeah I believe that with the media right now it's it's very hard because you only see certain things out there so if you're unaware of these things like many people are then it's really hard to actually get the message across and create an educated um, information and perception on the subject 
So as we have mentioned before, and you guys mentioned before, in politics it's very important to be educated in order to, to be able to determine what's the best plan, what, what's the next move. So I think that education, awareness, and um, exposure towards the subject would be, would be the best solution to help the problem. Yeah, and I think the, the biggest thing that we can do as millennials for American politics is probably make it a lot more bipartisan by making the issues more about the issues and more clear. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that one, because when you talk to politicians on both sides of, sides of the aisle, most people agree on a lot of things, uh, and they're actually all friends in, in Congress and so on. And uh, you, you then get this whole media coverage of the craziness of the battles and, the, um, and, and so forth. And I think that with better information, with transparency, with discussions of issues, we can actually, um, you know, in the gridlock. That's my hope. It's great. So just to, just to follow up to that, you know, one of the sort of sideline questions that, that is asked is, is when is this generation going to really, you know, get into politics? And having spent a lot of time on the Hill, I can tell you the vast majority of staffers are from Generation Y. They're under the age of 35. So who's doing the research? Who's writing the speeches? Who's running most of the campaign infrastructure? It's young people. And their answers are exactly indicative of their generation. It's not transparent. It doesn't work. It's not accessible, okay? So what we see is a tremendous amount of young people getting involved into politics, not running Politi not running uh, to become politicians, but involved in the infrastructure. And if we saw what would happen with Obama, that campaign was completely designed by, run by, and voted on, for the most part, by members of this generation. So it's kind of like, look, your system was a great idea, but it's a total failure. We're just going to wait until you die, and then we're going to make an app that we can vote with. Yeah. And we're going to put our thumb on our phone, it's going to scan our thumbprint, it's going to vote, and we're going to have an online, actual, transparent world. You say it'll never happen, just like the internet would never happen, just like the iPhone. Just before you dismiss that, that's the underlying sentiment, okay? You're dealing with 80 million people that are about to take over the world. Next question. Mm, a woman? Do we have any women? All men hands. A woman, yes, please. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that right now, for the for the careers that are available, it's a need. It's an, it's definitely a need. Uh, it's something that employers are looking for. But in my opinion, in my personal opinion, I think that yes, must uh, like a master degree and education is extremely important. But there's also a lot of application on. Um, I think experience in the workplace will teach you a lot more than other two years of school. Because I believe that being an undergraduate student, I've learned the theories, I've learned the do's and don'ts, but what I've really, really learned the most is in the workplace, surrounded by people, getting information from different people, networking. I think that's more valuable than any education that you can get, but I think it's, it's important in the world that we live in, and I think that it's gonna continue to be. I also think, too, is like she said, it is a need and it's becoming necessary because there's a big push for K through 12 to go to college. So it was like if everybody had a high school diploma, you needed a bachelor's. Now everybody's getting bachelor's, you need a master's. And eventually it's going to be everybody's getting a master's, so you need a PhD. But in fields like education for me, K through 12, if I pay 60 to $70,000 for a master's or a PhD, there's no return on that for me because my salary is not even half that. So, you know, you look at the need for it, but then you say, well, in my career path, will it really be necessary for me to go up and up and up when I'm losing money, going into more debt, taking out more loans, and I'm not seeing a return on it? Wow. 
I mean, I guess this is why we have things like Coursera and other platforms that are completely rethinking what this, what the post undergrad experience can be. The average, uh, the median age of a learner of the 12 million learners on Coursera is 29 years old. So it's, it's uh, the way, I guess the way we think about it is that you're always learning. There's no sort of line. There's not like this, you walk along this cliff and all of a sudden you're 22 and got my undergrad and off the cliff, right? Like you're always sort of climbing the learning plateau and uh, it's become more accessible. And I think some of the innovations that, that are at this summit um, is making learning more accessible and making uh, employment more about what you know, not where you go. It's about knowledge, not about college. Let me just piggyback off that question. If getting a master's was about an average of $10,000 and getting a PhD was the average of, let's say, 15000 would it be more interesting to you? Just yes or no, each one. Yes. 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 Yeah. Just curious. I paid 16 I think, for my master's. All in. Yes, please. Why is that? Great. Okay. Um, why is that? <laughs> why is that? <laughs> because because some of their friends are. <laughs> and they're. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say that um, when we look around, you know, you look at people who are 25 and 26 who are millionaires, and you're like, okay, I want to do that. I want to be that. And then you get to the workplace, and they're like, okay, no, you're entry level, and you need to work your way up. And you probably may or may not be CEO by 50. And you're like, that's way too long. So when you can Next see job. people that you, <laughs> so when you see people that are around you who are in very good positions or they make lots of money, you know, you look at people who dropped out of college and are millionaires now, maybe billionaires, and you say, you know, if they could do that, then why can't I do that? I also think that it's, it's related to the fact that we like to see results immediate. We want feedback. We want to know that we're doing our, our, our job well. So a sign of success is climbing up the ladder. A sign of success is um, getting a better salary. So if, we, if we're going to stay for a year and at an entry level position, that's not going to be fulfilling. It's not going to be motivating. So I think it's all about the values that we have, like as, as you said in, in, the, in the previous presentation, it's about the values that we have created for ourselves and the fact that... Oh, oops. Does that mean we're out of time or...? <laughs> um, subtle. Yeah. Very subtle. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, this is funny. And the fact that sometimes um, we can be impatient. We can be impatient and we want change fast. So, fascinating. Just, just to, just to, just. Did you have something else to say? About I that? do. Yeah, please. Could I offer a s suggestion as, uh, for you and for your kids and for your employees? Um, Reed Hoffman wrote this book called The Alliance, uh, and what he basically says is you should give employees challenges for a couple years, two to four years, and give them a stint and go have them build some part of your enterprise. And so. Um, what I found and what I do is uh, is being almost like a mini CEO for this little project and giving them the, the autonomy and the responsibility and to just go do that. You'll probably have a lot more success with retention and, and so on. And there's an there's a interesting stat that um, I think 64% of millennials would rather do a job for $40,000 a year as something they found interesting rather than a $100,000 job that they found boring. It's not about the money, it's about sort of the responsibility and giving them that uh, autonomy and, and runway. And I can attest to that because um, we pay our employees very poorly. <laughs> it's the film business, um, after all. The, the, the interesting thing that, you know, comes up from this, from that question, you know, why the want to be CEO right away, you know, again, their friends are already doing it. Um, it's fast, immediate. That's the culture that they've been brought up in. And for a lot of young people entering the workforce, 
uh, you go into a traditionally structured company and you see something that is inefficient, bureaucratic, uh, technologically inept, and they go, dude, I could run this thing so much better than these people. So part of it is the culture that they grew up in is showing them super efficiencies that again, it goes back to experience. That may be true on the outset. They may be able to add tremendous efficiencies in different areas, but there are subtleties, as you guys know, running your own businesses in running a business. So how do you create that long-term perspective? How do you create loyalty? Um, you know, we tell our employees when they come, you're probably only gonna wanna spend a year or two here. And that's totally cool because we're so excited that you're part of our extended family. Uh, and, and we keep in touch with all of our people. When they leave, they often they come back to work again. So, you know, we have all of these built-in little things. As you said, we do make them the CEOs of their own projects. Great, you three, you're in charge of this project. It lives or fails based on you. And we put meaning into everything we do, and we have the workforce generate some of that meaning, you know? Why is this project important? Why are we doing this? Should we do it? It's, it's, we try to create that lateral playing field, even though, you know, in my business, we have a very clear authoritarian structure um, that doesn't always work with this generation. Another question, in the dark. Yes, mister, I have the light on. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Oh, wow. Get frustrated and, and excited. Simple question. Oh. <laughs> can we do it? Can we just do frustration first okay. and then we'll do excitement? Yeah. Um, I think that I'm most frustrated about the fact that I'm discounted because I'm young and my um, SES status has discounted me a lot. Um, I graduated with a 4.0 GPA from high school, but I was told that I was at risk. So, um, you know, it's like things like that kind of put a negative damper on my view to society. And then when I go to a job, like I want to work at a juvenile justice school. Um, so those are the kids who are already in prison who are trying to get their high school diplomas. And I was told that I'm too young to work there and that I need to go and come back in 15 years when I'm seasoned because I'm not going to be good enough to work there. That's what I was told. But it's like I've been there for a couple of times and the kids respond to me better than they respond to teachers who've been there for five and six years. So it's just that discount and that, that being told that I'm not good enough just because I'm 21. Um, another thing that frustrates me is not getting enough feedback from my superiors. Um, I think that, as I said, yes, you can learn a lot from, from school and the feedback will be your grades, but there's nothing better than having um, a transformational leader that comes to you and tells you, this is what you're doing good. These are the areas that you could improve. And when you're so young and at like an entry level, they don't really care about providing feedback to you. They, they don't really care if, if they can give you a performance evaluation or not. And that's really frustrating because I'm in, in this time where I really want to learn and I really want to absorb information. So that's frustrating. <clears throat> well, and my organization, we actually do one-on-ones all the time. We thrive off of feedback. Uh, it's kind of a hierarchy in a sense, but it's where our, the core member could honestly affect and contribute to the way that our organization is set up. And so our, I guess, elders or Generation X does respect our point of view and really likes to include us in the conversation. Um, so on a work side, I'm not as frustrated as I should be in my generation.